Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Well, Tim has already preached and Trey has preached. We could actually go home right now and you can say you've heard God. Amen. I stirred up a little preach in the room this morning, just a little bit. Um, well, good morning. I, um, it's such an honor to get to speak this morning. Um, I said to the first service, because this is my house. And I get to speak other places, and I know I get to speak to our women a lot, and that's an honor to me also. But to get to stand up here on a Sunday morning at my house and, and speak out of my heart to you, where I've been raised, where I was, you know, my dad founded this church, and um, my brother, who I don't know what he was thinking leaving town, he's like, yeah, you can preach, Angela. I'm like, yes. And um, I don't have the cool little Britney Spears mic like he has, but... Um, that gets caught on his fat cheeks. I get onto him all the time. And I'm like, your mic was all muffled. And he was like, it was? So I give him a hard time about that. So he's actually, in, uh, I believe, in Arizona ministering today. And um, Pastor Pam is in uh, our sister church in Little Rock today in Arkansas. And uh, she went to uh, a wedding of a young lady there who has been coming to our women's conferences for several years and um, she had waited and waited and waited to find the man that God had for her life. And she's, I think she's in her early mid thirties. Um, and she shared her testimony in March when she was here that, and she went home and got proposed to. So Pastor Pam went to the wedding this weekend, uh, she and Anna. So that was, that's a lot of fun. I said, they all left town. See, and when the cat is away, we can do whatever we want today. Isn't this awesome? Tim even left the room right now. This is great. Uh-oh. Somebody say, uh-oh. I do believe I have a word to share with you this morning. And I love this service because this is the one I usually make it to. I try to make the 9 a.m. And But you guys are the caffeinated crowd. Woo! And you don't like to get up early if you're here. So, yay! Um, but I have, I have a message I hope today is going to stir something up in you. I said to the first service, I want to get all up in your Kool-Aid and stir it up today. Like when you used to make Kool-Aid and the sugar would settle down the bottom, you had to stir and stir and stir and stir. That's kind of what I want to do today. So you might as well go ahead and get ready. And I'm not like Pastor Lynn. I'm not just going to give you an awesome doctrinal message, and I want you to sit there and be quiet. You have to talk back to me, okay? So I want to hear from you. You're going to help me preach this message this morning. And um, I'm going to give you something free because I'm going to tell on myself before I really get into the message this morning. Tim made a really quick trip to Orlando this weekend, um, like a two-day trip. He left Friday morning, drove there, went to a, a, a meeting for work Friday night, and came back yesterday. And um, so I normally do not fix dinner at my house, okay? I, don't judge me, all right? I do fix dinner, but I don't fix like these family dinners, and we all sit down at 6 o'clock, and we, we don't even know what we're going to be doing at 6 o'clock any day of the week, all right? We're like everywhere. And so... Um, but Tim texted me, he's like, in Tallahassee, and this was like three-ish, and I'm like, oh, you know what, I'm going to cook dinner tonight, I I'm going to cook dinner, so when Tim gets home, and I've got the girls here, and I kind of have the afternoon off, that's what I'm going to do. So I go to all this trouble, I have the iPad out with the recipe, the whole shebang, I'm cooking, right, the kitchen's just like a wreck, everything's everywhere, and I have this amazing meal I cooked, and Tim gets home, and he's like, oh, I I ate at Cracker Barrel a couple hours ago, I'm, uh, but I'll eat something, honey. You know he's not going to eat because he totally gorged himself at Cracker Barrel, which is like his favorite restaurant besides Golden Corral, and I don't go to either one of those unless forced. But um, so I'm like, great, but Jazzy and Sophie will eat with me, and we have a teenager and a three-year-old, right? And so Jasmine's like, oh, when you were in the room or outside, I, I fixed mac and cheese. We already ate. I'm like, seriously? So I have this amazing spread of food. And at that point, this, this super mommy and super wife that had risen up in me went, Phew! and I cannot tell you I, how I would put it as I lost the magic at my house at that moment. What do you mean y'all ate? And what do you mean? Da, 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 da. I know y'all are like way more behaved than that at your house. 
on the night before I'm supposed to speak. And I told Tim, I was like, why don't you just preach tomorrow? Blah, 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 blah. And so he's like, I will, I will speak tomorrow. And I'm like, you know, we were having some very intense fellowship at the house. And, um, and so I was just like so upset. And I, and I left the house last night. I came up here for a little while and, and, um, and God said, you know, that's kind of like when you show up to church and, and worship is all spread for you. I have this amazing table all spread for you. And I worked and worked. I, I prepared. I've got it all ready. And all you have to do is pull your chair up to the table and eat as much of this amazing food as you want. And we come into church and we're like, nah, I don't really need that. I'm full. That's kind of how we do a little bit to God, don't we? When he prepares a meal, thank God he doesn't lose the magic on us, right? Okay, that was free. That had nothing to do with my message. But I had to tell a little bit on myself because I really was not a nice person last night. So I have to tell on myself so that God will somehow show mercy and grace to me. So anyways, that's sweet. But yeah, okay. I don't really deserve it. All right. Today, um, last time I spoke, I actually shared a message on process. I, I, I got to share at the women's conference back in March. And um, I shared a message about going through the process. And um, we talked about how film gets developed. And that for film to get developed, it has to go into the dark room. And it's in the dark room where the development of film and pictures in the traditional form of that process happens. And so I kind of want to pick up where I left off from that message. And I'm going to stay a little bit in that vein of going through the process. Because the reason why that's so important is because our whole life, this journey, this adventure that we're on with God at the center of it, hopefully, is this whole ongoing process. Because we are all a work in progress, right? And if I can say we are a work in the process. And the process is usually not fun, and it's usually messy a lot of the time, right? Wow, that's nice. Look at that. They didn't have that at the first service. They did? Wow. That's awesome. I'm big time now. You can introduce my video now. It's an inside joke with Tim. But I just believe when we get in the process there, there's a lot that happens. And in the process is when we want to quit. And in the process, and I talked a lot about that. And if you want to get that, you can get that message. But I want to take you um, to a story in Genesis chapter 16. And I want to talk about a little girl who, um, she was in a process that was not completely, it originally was her choosing. And then she had to walk through some stuff that wasn't her choosing. And we're going to talk a little bit about choices. Because choices are really important. Now, I, I am a, t a teacher. I was a principal. A lot of my background is education. And, and I know I say to kids, I say it to my own kids, I look at them and say, now listen, right now you have a choice. See, if I just tell them, they're like, I want you to sit down in your chair. And they don't sit in your chair. Okay, right now you have a choice. You can sit down in your chair or you lose your chair. Those are your two choices. Which would you like? And so choices are really important. And every choice we make has a consequence or a result that comes out of it. Every choice I make, every choice you make. And usually when we are in the messiest part of God's process on our life is when we don't make good choices. Because when the pressure comes on and the pressure hits and the pressure is all weighed down on me from undue things, from circumstances and people and unexpected things, the real me comes out. Right? Kind of like dinner last night. The real me comes out. When pressure comes on you, the real you comes out. Whether people want to see it or experience it or not, it's going to come out. Now, you're going to know I'm a, I, I'm a real, raw person. I'm going to get to the, the meat here pretty quickly. So let's go to Genesis chapter 16. And I'm actually going to start in the middle of the story. And we're going to go back 
and pick it up from the beginning in just a minute. But I'm going to start right in the middle of chapter 16 in verse 7. So this is about a little servant girl, and her name was Hagar. Okay? Hagar was a maid servant for Abram and Sarai at that time, and she was serving them. And there had been a bunch of stuff that had gone down, and she ran away. So in verse 7, we pick it up. She is by this, this stream or this river, the spring that's in the middle of this desert. And an angel of the Lord shows up and talks to her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, here's what I want you to hear. Where have you come from? And where are you going? So here we have this girl. She's run away. She's in the middle of a desert. She's pregnant, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And here she is. She has no idea where she is going. She is just trying to get away. All right? She, she doesn't even say where she's come from. She doesn't say where she's going. Um, I love her answer. Here's her answer. In, in, um, at the end of that verse, she says back to the angel, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. She didn't answer either one of those questions. She just said, hey, I don't know where I've come from right now. I don't like it there. I don't really know where I'm going. I'm just telling you I want out. I'm just telling you I'm running away. I'm trying to get away from what doesn't feel good. I'm trying to get away from something that has happened in my life that I don't know how to deal with. So that's what was happening with her. She didn't like it. She just knew she needed to go somewhere else. How many of you know when those moments come on, fear will start talking to you? I'm sure that's what was going through Hagar's mind because she really didn't think it through that she was going to be pregnant and go out in a desert by herself. This is not a good plan. This was not a good plan to go on, right? But she wasn't thinking about that. All she felt was disappointment and fear and all these things. And let me tell you something. The enemy will start talking to you right there. Because all I can see is getting away from that situation, getting away from that person, getting away from that moment. And that's all Hagar could see for the moment. So let's go back to the beginning of the story, and let's talk about how she got there. This is a really short chapter in Genesis, but it's a really powerful few scriptures. Genesis 16 and verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So Abram agreed, and I said before, yes, I'm sure he did, to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, gave her to her husband to be his wife, and he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So here's the little story. Now, I'm going to give you a little background on Hagar, because Hagar was Egyptian, and she had been with them, you know, for at least 10 years. And they had come into contact with Hagar back in Egypt. Because Hagar was actually the daughter of a pharaoh. She was a princess. And she probably had a pretty good life. I doubt she was a maid for anybody, but I bet she had several maids of her own and servants of her own. And when she encountered Sarai, if you read back in the history of her life, there's not a lot known about her. But if you read back in the history of her life, she came in contact with Sarai and Abram, and she saw something in them that she wanted. Because she saw the God on the inside of them. Enough to the point she was willing to give all that life up and go with them. Think about that. Now, you and I would never do that. 
I have this great life. Why in the world would I give that up? Because there was something more valuable than stuff that she saw on the inside of Sarai and Abram. So I know probably throughout these 10 years, she's been following Sarai around and she's been trying to get in her world and say, how does God do this for you? How do you hear God's voice? What's happening? How, how, I want to know what you know. I want to be like you. I want to understand God like you. So for 10 years, Hagar has been serving. Now listen, Hagar has left from being a princess. Now she has a job. She has a real job. She's a servant. And when this situation came up, I'm sure that she and Sarai were pretty good friends by this point. They probably spent a lot of time together. And I know this whole thing is just jacked up. This was normal back in the Old Testament. But anyways, the thing is, they started making decisions for her without her input. All of a sudden, Sarai decided, God hasn't done what I wanted, so I'm going to figure it out. Anybody else do that besides me? I'm going to go ahead and take matters into my own hands, and I can make this happen. If God's not going to let me get pregnant, I can make this happen. And guess what? Here's my number one right-hand person. She'd be the best person. She can just be a surrogate mommy for me, and this is all going to be great. And I don't think she went to Hagar and said, hey, how do you feel about this? You think this is a good idea? You think my husband's cute? Do you want to be involved in any of this? None of that was happening. They were making decisions for her with no input. She did not have a choice. Now she went from being friend and maidservant to being, you're going to do what we tell you to do. So don't think Hagar didn't have a little trouble with that. She didn't get asked how she felt about it. She didn't get asked to contribute. They were making decisions for her about her body, about what she was going to do, about who she was going to marry, what was going to happen. So you have this whole history in this background now. Do you have a nice picture of that? So she goes, she goes and gets with Abram, and she gets pregnant. Now, she is pregnant, and she's got a little bit of attitude. Because now she could do something that Sarai couldn't. And now, all of a sudden, what was supposed to be this great plan starts backfiring, right? So look at the next verse there. It says, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So now, she's going to do what Sarai told her to do, but now the tables have flipped. And the story wasn't supposed to go this way. And this person who's supposed to be in submission to me is now sending out little vibes and little comments and trying to take control of my world. I can just hear Sarai. I'm sure that she was queen bee of the roost there. And she's like, hey, 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 hey. So now things are starting to get stirred up just a little bit. And if you don't know what that's like, probably to the point that Sarai felt uncomfortable. Because now this person who works for me, who is my servant, I kind of created this mess. And now she is like, giving me what for? It sounds like a teenager. See, if you don't know what the, you know, you have the teenager gets this bad attitude. Maybe it's your spouse. I don't know. We'll go with teenager. And, um, and, and they're at home, and they're bad at you, won't lift a finger, won't do anything. And you avoid going to your house because you're like, I don't want to have to go in and deal with that. I don't want to have to. You're paying the bills. It's your house. It's your deal. And all of a sudden, those little things that they're doing are grading you so bad, you start backing up. So that happened a little bit with Sarah. So she got upset, and guess who she goes to complain to? Her husband, of course. And she, she goes in verse 5, Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible. I love that. 
for the wrong that I am suffering. That was like dinner last night. <laughs> that is your fault. You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And Abram, classic, your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So let's stop right there for a minute. So Sarai goes to Abram. She complains, blah, blah, blah. This is, you're responsible. Now she's pregnant. Now blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarai. This was your idea to begin with. Remember, remember when you jumped the gun and you wanted to make this happen and this was your idea and you cooked this whole thing up? I heard T.D. Jake say, it's like we create the fire and everybody chokes on the smoke. We don't understand why we're choking when I created the fire to begin with. Think about that. So, now you've got two women going at it. And Abram does not want to be in the middle of that mess. Abram probably wanted to run away. I have no doubt. He all men are always innocent in the middle of it, but I'm just saying he probably didn't he probably wanted out of that. How many of you've been between two angry women? That is not a good place to be. Hopefully it's not your mama and your wife, but it's not a good place to be. Right? That never happens for Tim never because the thing the thing when women get stirred up men will just say their thing they just say it they might fight they might throw a punch I don't know and then it's over it's just over women oh no we will take that thing for 20 years down the road and you will hold on to it and you will smile but you will know that thing is still there and you might do what you're supposed to on the surface, but you're still brooding that thing underneath. So you have Sarai and Hagar, who are both now mistreating each other. And I want to talk to you about three things that I believe that we run from out of this story. And really, we're going to talk a little bit about submission Turn to somebody and say, submission. That felt good, didn't it? Great. Submission. I waited till like middle of the message to tell you that word. Because you might have left before. Because we don't like to submit. I don't like to submit. I don't like to submit to anything. And at this point, Hagar did not want to submit under Sarai. So she was being all attitude, and then Sarai gets attitude, and then she had two choices at that point, fight or flight. Some of you are fighters, and some of you are flighters. Some of you want to stand up and fight the down. Some of you just want to run. I actually was going to bring my running shoes today, but I wanted to wear these shoes, so I didn't wear them. But I think one of the first things that we will run from is relationships. We want to run away from the relationships that God put in our life. We want to get away because what started out right went bad. And now I don't think I want to stick this thing out. Sounds like marriage. Sounds like life. I don't know if I want to stick this thing out because uh, this is getting a little messy and this is not why I got into it to begin with. I'm sure Hagar was thinking, I can't believe I left all that for this. But we run. We want to run away from the relationship that God puts in our life. And one of the reasons that happens, it's interesting in verse 2, that Sarai has this thought. She says, perhaps... I can build my family through her. That is a twisted thought, okay? Here's the deal. You can build for people. You can build with people. You cannot build through people. 
You have to do your own building. You can lock arms and team up and do it. You can do it for somebody who doesn't know how or is too weak to do it for themselves, but you can't do it through somebody else. You go build my ministry. You go raise my children. You go deal with my husband. You, no, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. That's where it started all wrong to begin with. But I believe that God put Hagar in Sarai's life and Sarai in Hagar's life for the right reason to begin with. God will put relationships in our lives that are supposed to be useful for us. And what happens is when things go the wrong direction, we end up getting used instead of being useful. Or we become the user instead of being useful. And when that happens, things get ugly. Turn to somebody and say, things get ugly. Y'all are really quiet. I'm going to have to wake y'all up. Y'all are not. I am preaching better than you're talking back to me. I'm just saying. Hopefully I'm stepping on your toes and you're like, I can't talk. That hurts. How I many of you know when we get hurt, we change? That's good. That's why spankings work. Amen, Jesus. Amen, Jesus. Sophie's down to five beatings a day right now. It's awesome. If you want to be humbled, just before I got up to speak right now at this service, Sophie wanted, she's like, I want your microphone. And I was like, no, I'm going to take it up there. And she's like, you talk too much. Give me the microphone. I'm like, great. Yes, spankings work. Woo. So we want to run away from relationships. We want to run away from the relationships that God put there. Because the enemy will always try to destroy the relationships that God put there. Now, sometimes we feed the ones the enemy puts in, and we have to know the difference. But I, I believe there are a lot of relationships in your life, some of you your marriage, some of you other relationships, that you are walking through right now, and you're deciding, am I going to be a fighter or a flighter right now? Am I, if God put this in my life, then there's a reason. And I've got to stick it out. We start running from what God intended to help make us to begin with. So it says at the end of that verse that after it got really ugly between she and Hagar, she fled. She ran away. Now we're back up to where we started the message, right? We're back up to where we started. Now it became this blame game. Between these two girls, Abram is out. Hagar's pregnant. She's, she's carrying this baby. And there was lots of complaining. There was lots of arguing. There was lots of intensity. They're retaliating against each other. And it got too much to bear. And she didn't want to take it anymore. And she just wanted out. There is this biblical principle called what you reap, you will sow. What you sow, you reap. Sorry. That's what I meant. That's why I keep him around. See? What you sow, you reap. So what you plant, what you put out there, is what you get back. So you have little Miss Hagar. She put attitude out there. Guess what she got back? Attitude. You put hate out there, you'll get hate back. You put love out there, you'll get love back. We forget that principle when we're all in a heated conversation. That just goes out the window. It becomes, you said, she said, you said, your fault, his fault, her fault, their fault. That's the second thing I think we run from is responsibility. Because we don't want to take ownership for the stuff that we might have not done right. Why won't my husband love me? Why is he out looking for somebody else? Because you are horrible to live with. And you don't take care of yourself. That's why. You have an attitude. Guess what you get back? If you're not sowing love, you're not reaping love. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? Y'all do not like this conversation right here. Just tuck your toes under the chair. It's the truth. If you don't like what you're getting back, then change. It's that simple, people. It's that simple. So you have this moment now where Hagar decides, I'm not going to fight this thing. I'm going to run. And it's interesting because Sarai's name actually means one of high rank. And in some translations, it was cool because I found one where her name actually meant quarrelsome. And Hagar's name means to take flight and be a fugitive. Don't think the enemy didn't have a plan from the beginning, but so did God. There are fighters and flighters. I said that in every house. In your house, in this house, you're going to fight it or you're just going to leave. I don't like it. That don't feel good. We run because of the mess and we miss exactly what God wanted to do in us because we run and we miss it. Sometimes it's worth it to stay and fight. So here goes Hagar. Her pregnant little self takes off running away, probably trying to get back to Egypt. I don't know what she's doing out in the desert. But think about it. She ran away from all security. She ran away from everything she knew, everything she had. Guess what? She was getting fed at Abram and Sarai's house. And pregnant women are hungry. She was getting fed there. She had all her needs met there. When she was going to go in labor, she had everything she needed there for that to happen. Well, I'm just not, I do not like how this, I'm just going to take my pregnant self right on down this road. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it my way. She's not going to talk to me that way. I'm carrying this. And out the door she goes, into the middle of the desert. Like, that is such a great experience. There's no water. There's no food. There's no people. There's no hospital. She's out in the desert. So she's going down, and it says, back to verse 7, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress. I don't have any other plans. I'm just running away. And I just want to take a minute and thank God how many times in our lives he sends an angel or something or someone to stop me before I do something dumb. Seriously, now, y'all didn't get that. Because there have been so many times I'm about to go handle it my own way. What if an angel had stopped Sarai before she cooked up her little idea? We could have avoided all of this mess. But all of a sudden, an angel shows up and says, Whoa, stop, stop, stop. Come on, God wants to send something in your life for some of you and stop something right now that's happening. He wants to pull you back because you've got your running shoes on and you're about to head somewhere you don't even know where you're going. Jesus, send an angel, send something to stop us from doing stupid stuff. Help us, God. Because we'll do it if somebody doesn't stop us. So an angel shows up and asks her that question. She says, I'm running away. And here's... This angel's amazing answer back to her. I'm thinking he's going to soothe her, love on her. It's okay, sweetie. I know you shouldn't be treated that way. This has been a rough season for you. Let me just, here, let me just help you. It's okay. That's not what he said. God said, go back and submit. Yeah, that is a sucky answer. Go back and submit. I know, if you're in church, somebody's like, I can't believe Angel just said that. My dad said way worse up here. I'm good. 
for sure. That's it. That's not the answer I wanted to hear. You know, when Tim and I were first married, we moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we had been there about three months. I had never lived out of my parents' house. You can imagine how that was. So the first couple months, it was kind of like playing house. It was pretty fun. I was like, oh, this is fun. Oh, yeah. And I was waiting to go back to my, my college semester in the fall, and we got married in June. So my classes weren't starting till September. Tim's trying to work a job, and all of a sudden it hits me. Wait a second. I don't really like this. I'm away from all my family. I'm away from everything. And it caused some intense conversations till one day there was a climactic moment of loud conversation that came to a head in our little apartment. And I said, I don't like it here. He would come home every day. I was still in my pajamas. I didn't get up. I didn't clean anything. I didn't cook anything. I didn't get dressed. Poor Tim, right? And I'd just be sitting there watching TV. I watched so proper. I, did, I was like a different person. I don't know what happened to me. I'll tell you what happened to me. I was all alone in the desert thinking, what have I done? And I told Tim, I hate it here. It's your fault I'm here. I miss everybody, blah, 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 blah. I just wish I was back at home. And he said, well, don't let the door hit you in the butt. Go. That was not the answer that I was expecting. That's where he convinces me why this is going to be so great and why I need to stay. And I thought, ooh, if I go home, my mama is going to be mad at me. And my dad is going to be mad at me. And they're going to kick my tail right back up to Chattanooga. So I might as well figure this thing out. But that's probably how Hagar felt. The angel looked at her and said, hey, go back and submit. Submit. Craig gave me this great definition of submission because I said submission is when you agree to come under the authority over you. He said submission is not agreement. If I agree, it's just agreement. Great, we're all on the same page. If it's submission, I don't agree, and I'm going to do it anyway. And how many of you know you can be submitted and still be nasty? You can have that nice nasty thing going on. I don't think that's the kind of submission the angel was talking about. He said, go back and submit. He didn't say, go back and see if Sarai will apologize. Go back, have coffee, try to work it out, see if y'all can be on the same playing field, see if you can show up at the same grocery store and not avoid each other. He said, go back. Y'all know what I'm talking about, too. You're like, whoop, whoop. Other aisle, other aisle. Don't want to see them. Don't want to see them. And then they come around. The, hey, how's it going? Y'all know you do it. I do it. You know you do it. But truthfully, he said, you got to go back and face it. And you got to go back. And you've got to submit under the person that I, I assigned your life to to begin with. Because you got a purpose on the inside of you that's waiting to be birthed. And if you don't go back, you're not going to see what I said. So I love this about God. He always gives us a hard choice, and then he follows it up with something really awesome. But he kind of waits to see if we're going to make the first choice, because otherwise we'll waste his good offer. I think he does, maybe he just does that to me. But he said, the angel of the Lord says, go back and submit. Then the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. So not only did he say, go do the hard thing, but then he said, now I'm going to promise you this if you do it. And the results of that are going to be far greater than this little moment you feel right now. See, if we can see way up ahead what God sees, we would do his choice every time. But because we don't see it, we, we mess up 50 times before we get there. 
I'm trying to avoid that. At least cut it in half today. You mean it might be God's will for me to stick this out and even if I'm not happy? Yes. It's not about your happiness. It's about what God wants for you. And if you'll get in line with what God wants, wants, he, he will return your happy. He will restore your happy. Amen? We're all going to go through seasons when things don't go the way I want. But I have to make up my mind to stay put until God does what he wants to do. We just want to run away. I'm going to wrap this thing up, all right? We get tired of it. It's not fair. It's not right. I want it my way. Life isn't like that. And if you think it's like that, then you're in fantasy land. So, Sarah made a choice to do that. And here's my favorite part. Because after the angel said, hey, go back and submit, then I'm going to increase your descendants. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child, which she probably knew, and you will have a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. And the name Ishmael actually means God hears. I think for the first time in Hagar's life, she encountered God for herself. Sometimes we do have to get to the desert and get by ourselves to God for so you can hear God and see him for yourself. I think she had been riding the wave of Sarai and Abram's God for 10 years. And she was thinking God wouldn't do this to somebody and God had to show up and talk to her himself. And he did. But it means God hears. And I think at that moment, she made up her mind. I, 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 I'm going to go back. Sometimes you go home because that's where you live. Sometimes you go home because it's where your stuff is. But listen, wherever home is for you, wherever it is you're supposed to go back to, that's where God's chose to feed you in this season. And you need to be faithful to that place, even when it doesn't feel good. Because if God wants to do a miracle for me in the middle of my mess, then all I can do is throw my hands up and say, all right, God, I'm going back. What do you want me to, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? How fast can I do it for you? How high do you want me to jump? We have to be to that place. So after the angel said that, I love... Hagar's response, because she said in verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. See, all of a sudden, God became real to her in this moment. Before that, she probably just always called him the Hebrew God or Sarai's God or whoever's God. But now she says, I'm going to give you the name for me, that you are the God who sees me. You're the God who sees me. You see me in my mess? You see me in the good and the bad and the ugly. You see me for who I am. And she says, for I have now seen the one who sees me. All of a sudden, her ears got opened and the blinders dropped off her eyes. You know, God will provide comfort in the most uncomfortable places. I bet for the first time in her life, Hagar felt the most security she'd ever felt. See, that's why she could go back and submit. Because now, what was in her was rooted in the one who sees her, not in what everybody else sees. They saw her pregnant belly, a big mess up, a big mess. But now, she's like, but God sees me for something else. And like I said earlier, that thing that was in her, if she had gone ahead and run away, she never maybe would have birthed that thing and seen what God wanted to do through her life. Yeah, the, the baby she was carrying wasn't Isaac, the son of promise, but that baby 
had a lot of destiny on his life, no matter how he came about. That was God's promise to her. We have to go back and submit. We have to go back where God is sending us back to, even though it's uncomfortable, and you've got to stick it out. It all came down to one thing, whether she was going to submit and do it or not. And I just believe that there are, there are people in here this morning that you have had runaway tendencies going on in your life. Maybe you've been on the run. Maybe you are on the run. Maybe you're planning to run. <laughs> maybe one of your kids is planning to run. Maybe somebody in your life is trying to run. I'm just telling you, there's an anointing in the room to go back and submit. There are some people in your house, in this house, you need to go back and submit and quit having one foot out the door and one foot in. Because let me tell you something, the one who sees you is going to chase you down. Hagar was not looking for God. Believe me, she was running away from everything, God or Sarai or Abram or anything. But listen, it didn't matter because God was the one who saw her. And here she is. She's running this way. And God's like running right after her, running, running, running right after her till he caught her. That's what God's doing to some of you this morning. He's chasing you down. He's chasing you to where you are, and he's not going to let you go. He's about to stop you and turn you around and say, come on. It's the way God has to do me because I'm doing my own thing. I'm going to figure it out. And God's like, bah, 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 bah. give me your hand. Come on. Come on, Ange. This way, this way, this way, this way. And the worship team can go ahead and come. I told, I told the story back in um, March that in October I went on a trip by myself to Jacksonville to a, a conference, mainly because I wanted to get away. Maybe I wanted to run away a little bit. But I was ready to run away. I was ready to quit, and I did not want to do this anymore. I did not like anything that God has done for the last couple of years. I was not happy with his decisions. He does not really care, but I was not happy. And I wanted to run away. And there, I felt the whole time I was gone, the eyeballs of God following me everywhere I went. And I'm like, ah, get off me. Let me just run away. Let me be, leave me, leave me, leave me. And God's like, oh, no, 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 no. Give me your hand. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And it took a little while because God asked me the question, do you want to do what I've called you? Do you want to do this thing or not? And I did not give him an answer. Because he said, I can do this thing with you, or I can do it without you. That's another not good answer for people like me, because that's not what I wanted to hear. He's like, listen, I'm going to do this thing. The vision at Jubilee, the thing that I've called your life, I, all that's going to happen. And you can be right up in the middle of it, or you can be sitting on the sidelines watching somebody else do it. Which would you like to do? Because God doesn't need me. I need him. And I had to come to that realization that me needing him was more important. That's why I love that Hagar just didn't stop with, you're the God who sees me. I have seen the one who sees me. Because I need him. And no, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. And no, I'm not going to run away. Do I feel like running away sometimes? Sure. Sure. But my choices are everything. And, the, and what I do in the mess is what's going to determine what happens. Because God's going to do it his way either way. And I'd rather do it the easy way. Just before I just pray over some of you this morning, and I'm telling you, I know this is not an easy message to hear, and it's always like, she, she must be talking about her. She must be talking about him. No, I'm talking about you. Because there's areas in our life 
that are on the run. And we got to pull those things back in and go back to where God said, go back to the first place you fell in love with him. Go back to that first place because he's going to chase you down. And there was uh, a few years ago, Katie Busby, you weren't here in the first service and I talked about you. Isn't that awesome? You don't know if it's good or bad yet. I'm just kidding. She, she was at a place in her life she wanted to run away. She won't mind me saying that. She wanted to run away. She probably tried to run away a few times. She probably still has, but we won't let her go. God won't let her go. And she and Trey wrote this song that no matter where we go, God's going to find you. No matter what mistakes I make, it doesn't matter. I'm going to stick this thing out. I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to stick out what God said. And I want you just to close your eyes right now. And I want you to listen to the words of this song. And I want you to let your ears open and your spiritual eyes open like they did with Hagar. And I want you to let the Spirit of God begin to come and penetrate the areas of your heart that are wanting to run. Because Jesus is enough. Come on, Trey. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. I made some mistakes. I went the wrong way. But this is who I am. Now all that remains is the pain of my shame. This is who I am. Mercy, do with every rising of the sun. Peace that restores my soul. Your hands lift me back up where I belong. You are the only.
Where could I run that you won't see? Where could I hide that you won't be? Your love is chasing after me. Oh, you hold my hand, you see me through. Your love is making me his way to run after you to go out of his way to run after you and stop you and yank you and set you back in the place that he has for you come on just stand to your feet all over the room come on just stand to your feet see I recognize that I owe my whole life to him whole life to him don't ever stop chasing us God there's nowhere I can hide come on if that's you this morning you feel God chasing after you you need to run to the front of this building and grab the hand of God this morning and say take me through take me through don't let go don't give up take me through come on if that's you i want you to come up to the front right now come on don't wait don't wait don't wait don't wait some of you are about to feel the holy spirit like you haven't felt him in a long time hey come on god chase us chase us chase after us oh we need you we need you we need you we need you god we need you more than we need ourselves more than we need our mess we need you god we need you oh come on come with the desperation where could i run Where could I hide that you won't be? Your love is just a me. You hold my hand to see me through. The love is making all things new. Jesus, that is who you are. Where could I run that you won't see? Where could I hide that you won't be? Your love is chasing after me. You hold my hand to see me through. Your love is making all things new. Jesus, 